Man, I think we could just pack it up and go home right now. That'd be enough, wouldn't it? That was fantastic. And the, your declarations this morning just may have touched my heart. And just appreciate you being here today. We welcome our online audience into the house here today. Thank you for uh, joining us and just being part of our worship today. If you're a guest today, brand new to Grand Point, we want to give you a very special welcome into the house. The last two weeks here have been rather fantastic, haven't they? Uh, with some of our guest speakers, with Cressa and Barrick, and uh, really appreciate what they did and taking a part of this series. So here's, here's uh, what you need to know, is we have that very intentional uh, development and recruiting system to raise up new leaders. I want you to continue to pray for Cressa and Barrick and others that are just uh, kind of following God and just discovering where he's leading them. And it is so good just to uh, have them share and minister to us uh, over the last two weeks. Hope you're not disappointed that I'm back, uh, but it's good to be back with you and continue this series that we're working through this summer called Questions That Jesus Asks. I don't know if this is happening to you, but uh, I met a guy at a wedding yesterday who's watching now from a little community outside Baltimore. By the way, if you're watching today, welcome. And uh, so good to have that family uh, connected. But he said this, he said, every time you ask one of those questions or deal with one of those questions that Jesus asked, it seems like it's just for me. Like, why do you worry or where, you know, all, all those kind of things. Now, maybe this is connecting with you as well. It is for me. A lot of these questions that Jesus asked are coming right to my heart as well and helping me discover and open up some things about myself. So today we're going to ask another one of the questions that Jesus asked, and that question is, what do you want me to do for you? Imagine Jesus coming up to you and asking that request, what do you want me to do for you? What would your answer be? We're going to discover that today, but before we do that, I feel like I need to let you know that I'm becoming more and more aware every single day of my life that I am now living in the category of old age. <laughs> I kid you not, it's simply the progression of life. You're young, and then you're middle age, and then you're old. Now, I know they say age is, is relative, but uh, middle age is, is pretty clearly defined. It begins anywhere between the ages of 35 and 40, and it ends anywhere between the ages of 55 and 60. After that, you're just old. You're just old. <laughs> I saw a t-shirt this week, and, and uh, you know, all of us are coming to grips with that, but I saw a t-shirt this week that said, it's weird being the same age as old people. <laughs> Isn't that great? I'll tell you, there's several reasons why, why I know that I'm old or getting old. So at Grand Point Church, we, we intentionally want to develop and hire younger staff, right? So that our staffing doesn't get so old that we can't connect with the next generation. So we hired a couple millennials uh, lately. And it's, it's interesting, the millennial conversation is different uh, than perhaps what, what us old people are used to. Uh, they have redefined the English language in a sense, and I, I say uh, they kind of rewritten it uh, because they use words like when, when, they, when we say totally, they're just like totes, right? Just totes. If, if they describe themselves as an independent, they don't use that four syllable word. They're just like two syllables. We're just indie. We're indie, right? So it, it's redefined. So I know that I'm old when I complete words or use full words. In fact, this past week, there was a, a meeting that we had. It was an exciting meeting. And we came out of that with some great creativity and everybody wanted to capture uh, the creativity. And they said, how are we going to do this? And someone said, well, why don't we just share it on Slack? And I remember hearing one of the members saying, well, he's the only guy that's not on Slack. So they are gracious enough yet to answer my emails. You know that email, Facebook, is for old people, right? That's old. There's different platforms right now that uh, kids communicate on. Uh, but one of the reasons I know that I'm old is because the music that I like is now referred to as classic rock. <laughs> it used to just be rock, but now it's classic rock. But I think one of the reasons why I know I'm getting old is the things that happen to my body, right? Uh, you, you, they, they say that uh, you're only as old as you think. But I'll tell you, I understand the power of the mind. But you can't deny the fact that there are some things that change in your body uh, as you get older. I'm discovering that my mind and my body have more tensions and more conflict than ever before. Right? In my mind, I'm still young, but my body's not quite there. It says something different. That came to the realization this past week when we were out with our cycling team. Uh, Tuesday night, we were cycling with Franklin County cyclists, and we're in this uh, community called Cleversburg. 
Someone asked me once, where's Cleversburg? You know where Cleversburg is? That, yeah, some of you know. And uh, there's a road in Cleversburg called Horse Killer Road. Hey, you're familiar with Horse Killer Road. That's a real road, and it's named that for a reason, right? It has a pretty intense incline. Now, back in the days when horses and carriages were there, this killed their horses. It's probably now more of an old man cyclist killer road. I don't know, but uh, so I, I, by the time we got to Horse Killer Road, I'm already, my body's already saying, you can't do this. You can't do this. This is about 12 miles into the ride. My mind is saying, yes, you can do this. So my mind won, at least temporarily. I'm with, riding with uh, all people that are younger than me. So we're starting up this, uh, this, this mountain, a pretty intense uh, climb. And uh, halfway up, my body is saying once again, this is for younger people. This is for young people. So I'm riding with these guys, Aubrey Burkholder and Isaac Covert. Their combined age is less than mine. And uh, so these guys are, these guys are like taking off up this mountain and I'm following them and I'm, I'm getting further and further behind. And I made it to the top, but these guys were so gracious. They're up at the top cheering the old man as I just crested that, that top of the hill. But see, my body's not quite, quite where it used to be anymore. The other thing that my body is kind of telling me is, has to do with vision. I've had fairly good eyesight all of my life. I've wear, I have prescription glasses probably since my late 40s, but my eyes have been fairly good. But something's changing. My eyesight is, is changing right now. So if you're sitting like five rows or back, you're in a pretty good uh, zone there. You're kind of like, I know that you're there, but you're, you're like, Kind of those people on the witness protection program, like you're, you get kind of little pixelized views there. So, so, but no, nobody wants to lose their vision, right? Losing your vision is horrible. It, it's, it's one of those things we don't want to do. So we do things to correct that, obviously. But, but when you lose your vision, you know, you, it limits what jobs you can get. It sometimes, uh, you know, limits, uh, you know, what you can read or what you can see. You go to a restaurant right now, you're pulling out your phone light just to read the menu, magnifying glass maybe in the other hand. But sometimes you can't drive after dark or maybe even drive at all. Loss of vision can lead to real harm and even disaster. I want to share with you today what is true of your physical eyes is also true of your spiritual vision. It really is. When you lose your spiritual vision, man, it just ends in disaster. Just horrible things come. It's so easy for me today like to become so critical of things and decisions that people make out there in our world, whether it's within our political world or community or, or whatever. I get critical because they make all these decisions that have these devastating choices uh, to our families, to our economies, to basic morality, to national security. And sometimes people make these decisions and I'm like, what are you thinking? Do you not know what that's going to do in the long term to our nation, to our families or whatever? But listen, the answer is ra relatively simple. He, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 uh, defines this or explains this. In fact, it explains a lot of things. And in that text, it says the God of this age has what? Blinded. Blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The world does not get it because they cannot see. They don't get the right choices. They don't get the right decisions. So they're making their decisions based on the blindness that they live in. See, the Satan's number one goal is to prevent people from seeing the light of the gospel. If he can keep people in the dark, he's happy. Darkness defines sin. It defines where we, those of us who are now living in the light, it defines where we once were, right? We were in the dark, but now we live in the light. But the world of unbelievers is still living in the darkness, so they can't make choices or decisions that have life-giving consequences or results. Now, you might say, well, what about believers, though? I understand about unbelievers, but what about believers? Don't some of those people also make some bad choices? Listen, what you need to know is this. What Satan cannot prevent, he will pervert. If he cannot prevent you from making a decision to live for Christ or, or to have spiritual vision, he will do everything that he can to distort or pixelize your spiritual vision so that you do not see clearly. It has been said, I think even C.S. Lewis once said this. He said, uh, Satan does not care how many Christians there are as long as he can render them ineffective. 
right? So if he can render us ineffective with our spiritual vision, he's got us right where he wants us. So today what I want to do is talk about spiritual vision and uh, how we might uh, have a prescription uh, for that as well. When the Bible talks about spiritual vision, it's talking about our ability to see and take to heart the truth about who God is and what he's all about. It's also the truth about ourselves and who we are and what our purpose is. So it's just allowing us to see that that's what spiritual vision is. And if we lose that vision, it will result in some very serious problems. Instead of trusting God, we'll now doubt him and we'll doubt his word. We'll live with all of these doubts instead of following the path that he has intentionally and personally prepared for you to lead you into great places, you'll now choose to walk your own path thinking that your way is better. And, and a lack of spiritual vision, I'll tell you, is even more disastrous than not being able to see with your physical eyes. I want to go to a story in Mark chapter 10 today where Jesus talks about this spiritual reality by using the actual uh, physical blindness as, as an illustration, as a spiritual reality. The context is this. Jesus is now leading his disciples on the road to Jerusalem. He knew that his time was coming when he would depart this earth, and he's leading them into Jerusalem. It's a very intense moment in his life, very passionate moment, because he knows what's in Jerusalem. But they're about 20 miles away. They're outside of Jerusalem, and they come to this little town of Jericho, and they're in Jericho and about to leave. And here's where the story begins in Mark chapter 10, verse 46. And they came to Jericho. And as he, that's Jesus, was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting, a son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Let me take a little break from the text to let you know why he was using that designation, why he was calling Jesus the son of David. See, faithful Jews at that time had long been looking for a king that was promised from the Old Testament scriptures. They were looking for a king who was from the line of David, who was the anointed one, who would fulfill all the promises that he had made uh, at, at that time. And so the king that they were looking for was from the line of David, anointed by God, a king who would come and fulfill all these promises. So we have every reason to believe that what Bartimaeus is essentially saying when he cries out, we have every reason to believe that he's essentially saying, uh, Jesus, Messiah, the promised king, have mercy on me. Bartimaeus was physically blind, but he was beginning to have some spiritual vision. And the people around him did not know what to do with that. See, spiritual vision messes with people who do not have it. This happens all the time. Spiritual blind people do not know what to do with spiritual vision. So here's how it works. When you get a glimpse of God and what God wants to do in your life, and you let him do it, and you experience God working in your life and shaping you and molding you and moving you into places you never thought, listen, you won't be able to stop talking about it. In fact, you'll have spiritual conversations with people in your family, people in your neighborhood, people in your workplace. The sad thing is about a lot of God's people is they never have spiritual conversations. For some reason, we shy away from that or we're not comfortable with that at all. But listen, when God really gets a hold of your life and gets a grip in your life, listen, you may have some spiritual conversations. And when you do, the people around you, are not, they're not going to know what to do with you, right? And chances are they're going to attempt to silence you, right? They're going to just kind of ignore you or they're going to try to change the subject or they might even say, listen, we're not into that kind of stuff. That might be good for you, but it's not good for me. See, when you have spiritual conversations, don't be surprised that people don't know what to do with you. In fact, the only thing they'll do is to try to keep you quiet. Now, in the big picture, that explains why the world and its defining culture is, is constantly working to try to silence anyone whose voices acknowledge Jesus as king. The world is pitifully desperate in their attempts to do this, by the way. So they come along and say, hey, let's ban Bible reading and prayer from public places. 
Let's take the authority over morality away from God and let's put that on our politicians. Let's put negative labels on people who have spiritual vision and let's legislate what they can say and what they can't say. Let's just try to keep Christians quiet. That's what our culture does. They're desperate, but it's nothing new. When Bartimaeus got this spiritual vision and he began calling out to Jesus, son of David, it says in verse 48, many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. Again, they tried to silence the voice or the voice of vision and spiritual vision. Now, we don't know exactly why they said this, maybe because a blind person in this culture was considered an outcast. They were marginalized, no real recognized voice in society. Maybe that's why they wanted him to be quiet, or maybe it was because his spiritual vision intimidated their lack of vision. But their rebuke did not intimidate Bartimaeus. It says in verse 48, he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, if you go back to Psalm 72, Psalm 72 is a passage that gives us a more definitive picture of what this coming king was going to look like and what this coming king would do. It was what was prophesied, and I think Bartimaeus knew this scripture because Psalm 72, verse 12, it says of this coming king, He will deliver the needy who cry out. It's exactly what Bartimaeus was doing. And he knew about this promised king who would deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence for precious is their blood in his sight. Listen, Jesus has a heart for people who are desperately needing. And so when Jesus heard the cry of Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus was simply saying, Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus heard that, and he stopped. And verse 49 says this, Jesus stopped and said, call him, call him. And, 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 and the man, uh, they called the blind man, saying to him, hey, take heart, get up. He's calling you. I, I love this, uh, verse 50, and throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, here's our question, what do you want me to do for you? This is a blind man, a physically blind man coming to Jesus and Jesus saying to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. Now, on the one hand, this seems rather straightforward, doesn't it? Here's a blind man, he can't see anything. He knows about this Jesus or this coming king who is a healer who reaches out and is coming for those who are desperate, one who will respond to those who cry out. And now he's there. Jesus is passing by. So Bartimaeus in his blindness, knowing that Jesus is there, cries out and Jesus heals him. It it, it kind of seems obvious, but it might be surprising why Jesus would even ask the question. You several times in this series, I've already said that Jesus is not asking these questions because he needs information from us. No, for the most part, Jesus is asking questions for the benefit of of those that he's talking to, to lead them into some discovery about themselves. A lot of these questions have done that for me, and hopefully they have for you as well. But I'm not sure that that's why Jesus is asking the question this time. So if he's not asking the question to get information, and if he's not asking the question for the benefit of the blind man, why is he asking the question? I think the answer is found a little bit earlier in Mark chapter 10, and I'm moving backwards through this chapter this morning, but a little bit earlier in Mark chapter 10, Jesus asked the very same question that he asked the blind man to a group of his disciples. Now, you're either going to love these guys, you're going to hate them, but Jesus is with his disciples on the way to Jerusalem. And Jesus just revealed his plan for the world. He's like, he's, he's walking with these guys and he says, guys, I, I'm telling you right now, when we get to Jerusalem, they, the authorities there are going to hand me over uh, to the Gentiles. They're going to condemn me to death and hand me over to the Gentiles. They're going to mock me. They're going to spit on me. They're going to flog me and they're going to kill me. But in three days, I'm going to rise from the dead. And Jesus is pouring out his heart. He's passionate about this. Imagine knowing that that's coming. Imagine knowing, walking into Jerusalem, that that's going to happen to you. 
And Jesus did. And his heart was breaking. And he wanted to share this with the, the group of disciples, the ones that he loved so much. But right after he did that, Look what James and John said, verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, this is right after Jesus shared this with them. They came up to him and, and said, hey, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. <laughs> it's pretty bold, isn't it? We want you to do for us whatever we ask. Did you ever have someone come up to you and say, hey, just promise me one thing? What's that one thing? I need to know what that one thing is. Right, so it kind of reminds me of that story in, uh, in Mark chapter 6, true Bible story, where King Herod decides to have a birthday party for himself. Like, I don't know if anyone th was not thrown a party for him, but he invited uh, his dignitaries, he invited his friends and all these high-level people to come into his birthday party, and he hired his sister-in-law's daughter to be the dancer. Now, this is all in the Bible, so I'm not kind of, I'm not making this up, but it kind of gets kind of graphic here. But this girl came in and she danced beautifully for uh, King Herod. In fact, the Bible says it pleased him so much that he called her to him and he said to her, listen, you have done such an amazing job dancing tonight at this party. Ask me anything that you want and I will give it to you. Now, Granted, by this time, he may have had, this time in the party, King Herod may have had a little few too many hillbilly hot toddies, <laughs> but um, he made this promise. He made this promise, right? That he would, and he had to deliver because all these people were there. And so she went to her mother and together they came up with this plan. And she came back and said, hey, yeah, there is something that I want. I want John the Baptist head on a platter. Now, see, I never want to get caught up in something like that. So when Penny says to me, Lawrence, would you do something for me? I simply say, what is it that you want me to do for you, right? <laughs> I never want to make a blind promise unless I know what they want. So, but here's Jesus. Now, this is a different context, obviously. But when James and John said to Jesus, hey, Jesus, we want you to do with us, for us whatever we want. Jesus came right back and said, what do you want me to do for you? Now, in asking this question, I want you to see that Jesus was helping them with their spiritual vision. See, they had some blind spots, and I think we all have some blind spots when it comes to asking God for things. Like, I told you they were bold, right? Now they come back and they answer Jesus in verse 37. They said, here's what we want. Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left hand, in glory. Like, these were places of, of honor. And they're like, Jesus, could you just kind of arrange for us to have the places of honor? Could you just kind of like, like give us some glory, right? We're seeking some glory. Now, I want you to get the picture. Jesus just told his disciples what was going to happen to him in his passion, in his, in the week that was coming. He was going to go to the cross soon. And he's just sharing this with them heart to heart. And they come right back and say, Jesus, we want you to do for us whatever we want. Now, we can come down pretty hard on the disciples at this point, but listen, I'll just tell you this. Whenever we lose our spiritual vision, we tend to see our relationship with Jesus as something to leverage for our own benefit. And we do it all the time. It seems like sometimes, it, and this might be a sad commentary, but sometimes the older we become in our faith, Right, The less we begin to see what we've been delivered from, we, we, we don't see anymore God's mercy and his grace that delivered us from being dead and being blind. See, I love the testimony of new believers because they're, they're excited about what just happened in their lives. They're excited about the change. But sometimes when we grow old in our faith, we kind of forget that. We lose our spiritual vision and now we come to God with questions like, Jesus, what, what could you do for me? Bless me, God, and just give me a great day today. Give me health and strength. Give me traveling mercies. God, just make the weather cooperate with my plans today. God, would you change them so that my life would be easier? You see what I mean? Sometimes it becomes so much about us. We lose sight of what God wants to do for the world in terms of redeeming the world and saving the world and bringing them into a place where they have spiritual vision. 
But our prayer life becomes more about what we want. And we tell Jesus, this is what we want him to do for us. We can easily drift into this place where we leverage our relationship with Jesus simply for our benefit. We want Jesus to do what we want. Our blind spot is perhaps we attempt to control Jesus rather than have him just control us. So James and John, as well as the other disciples, they also knew that Jesus was the Messiah. Uh, he previously told them this on several different occasions, and they knew all about that. But the difference between Bartimaeus and James and John was that Bartimaeus saw Jesus as the Messiah and simply saw himself as a beggar in need of being saved, in need of being healed by the Messiah. He just wanted Jesus to heal him so that he could follow him. But James and John saw themselves as worthy of honor, and they wanted Jesus to serve them. And Jesus said to them in verse 38, guys, you don't know what you're asking. You really don't know what you're asking. And, and then instead of ridiculing them or instead of just kind of condemning them for, for doing what they did, he, he interviews them in a sense. And he, he says in verse 39, can you drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Stay with me for a moment. This gets a little bit, a little bit deep here, but both the cup and the baptism are symbols of suffering and death that Jesus was about to experience. You, you might remember when he was in the garden praying the night before he was crucified. I mean, he was, he was just at that place of, of intense passion. And he said, Jesus, is there any way that this cup could be removed from me? The cup of suffering. The same thing is true with baptism. It, it, it's, it's a symbol of Jesus' death and his burial. So the cup and, and, and baptism are both symbols of suffering that Jesus was about to experience. Both describe this, this severe, though temporary, judgment of God that he brings on sin. But, but here, here's, here's the good news I want to remind you of. Jesus took and experience the cup and the baptism so that we won't, so that we don't have to. What mercy, what mercy, a mercy that we dare never, never lose sight of, never lose vision of, or we drift to making life more about what we need rather than what Jesus did. Now, J Jesus asked James and John, can you do this? Can, can you drink the cup and can you be baptized with the baptism that I'll be baptized with? And they're like, yeah, we can do that. So let me just summarize Jesus' response. He said, okay, you will drink the cup and you will be baptized with the baptism that I'm being baptized with. But for me to grant whether who, who sits on my right or my left is not for me to grant. So basically what Jesus was saying at this point was he's talking about the status of greatness and what it means to be great in the kingdom. And he says, that's not for me to determine or me to declare. What Jesus is saying is the status of greatness is not achieved by who you are, but by whose you are. Greatness is not climbing the ladder. It's getting off the ladder and serving others with the love of Christ. Greatness is not seeing yourself as someone to be served, but seeing yourself as a servant to others. In fact, Jesus wrapped this up by saying, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for others. Bartimaeus saw himself in the light of who Jesus was, and all he could say was, Jesus, Jesus, have mercy on me. Now, the disciples saw themselves in light of who they were, and they say, Jesus, would you do for us what we want? Now, in both cases, Jesus is working to restore their sight. Bartimaeus was blind physically, but he was now receiving some spiritual sight. The disciples had, 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 uh, had physical vision, but, but they were blind spiritually, and Jesus is working to restore both. Now, this, by the way, does not mean that we cannot pray specifically for things like big, bold prayers like, God, heal my marriage. God, uh, give me this. God, I'd like a new job. We, we can do all that. But listen, it, it determines, I think, it, or it, it defines the attitude by which we come to prayer and, and what, how we ask Jesus for things. Are we trying to control him? Or are we coming in submission and surrender saying, Jesus, here's what I want. Here's what my needs are. But listen, I want you to provide what is best for me. See, when we surrender and submit to Jesus, we get to see more than we ever expected. 
Here's what happens. Sometimes we come to Jesus and we have a list. and We think we know exactly what we need. And so we're going to ask Jesus for this. And we're going to ask him to maybe save us from something that we're going through or get us out of this current situation that we're in. We ask Jesus maybe for a new job or maybe, you know, to heal something physically or heal a relationship or whatever it might be. And that's, that's, that's who we are. See, see, prayer, prayer is uh, not a place to be perfect. It's a place to be honest, right? And so we come to Jesus just with this honest uh, longing in our hearts. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you're not trying to manipulate Jesus. Because see, here's what happens. Jesus sees the big picture. He has all the information, and he knows exactly what he wants to do with you as you're going through these situations. He knows what he wants to do and how he wants to mold you and make you and strengthen you for your life, or maybe prepare you for something that's coming down the road. He has the big picture, and sometimes we pray for Jesus to take things away that he is strategically using to make us better to bring us into that place where we really want to be. So when you go to Jesus and you say, Jesus, and you kind of demand or say, Jesus, I want you to do for me whatever I want, I guarantee you, you'll be be disappointed. You'll be disappointed and you'll come to that conclusion that God does not answer prayers because I've been praying this and he didn't answer. It's because he has more information than what you do. He sees the big picture. So the better way would be to come to Jesus like Bartimaeus did and say, Lord, just restore my sight. Help me to see what's really going on here. Help me to see what you're doing through this uh, trying time in my life. Help me to see what this challenge means to me and just give me spiritual vision to see your plan in this and, and not necessarily mine. See, when we surrender and submit to Jesus like that, we'll get to see more than what we've ever expected. Now, let me leave you with this. If Jesus came to you and he said to you, what do you want me to do for you? What would you say? How would you answer that? Do you you want Jesus to give you power? Do you want Jesus to give you wealth? Do you want Jesus just to give you, you greater health? Do you want Jesus to fix your marriage? Do you want Jesus to change your family? Do you want Jesus to give you a better job? Imagine Jesus coming to you and you get that one, with that one request that you get to give to him, what would it be? See, unfortunately, we often present Jesus with uh, things that really miss what our true need is. We come to him with all these little things about our world and about our little kingdoms. We sometimes miss the greater things that he is wanting to do in you and through you for his kingdom. We, we, we miss the big problem. We want Jesus to give us comfort. We want Jesus to give us ease in this life. We want happiness. It's kind of what we seek. We ask him for all those things. We often want Jesus to do things for us that are so focused on this world and sometimes even border on selfishness. Now, again, it's not wrong to ask Jesus for your family. We've done that through the song that we sang today. It's not wrong to ask Jesus for deliverance from addictions and oppression and all those dark things in our lives. Not at all. But it's not coming to Jesus and just saying, Jesus, I want you to do this for me. It's coming to him, recognizing his mercy and his grace, the substitutionary atonement that this speaks of through the cup and and, and the baptism. And all that he did for us, he took all of that and paid the ransom so that we can have life. And it's coming to him recognizing that and having our hearts eternally grateful for all that he's done for us, saying, God, just show me your mercy. But I think it has to happen more than once. I think it's every single day of our lives. Every day we need to wake up and realize that what we need is to see Jesus because we're blinded by the world. We're blinded by our selfish ambitions. We're blinded by the God of this world. We're blinded by, by our fears. We're blinded by all those things that, we, that, that are just so much a part of life. But the sight that can only come by recognizing our disability is when Jesus Christ opens our eyes and gives us that spiritual vision. 
But listen, we have to know that we're blind so that when Jesus comes to us and asks what he wants to, what, what, what we want him to do for us, we simply say, restore my sight, Jesus. Restore my sight. And give me the vision to see you and what you're doing in this world, what you're doing in my life. Give me vision to see how I might become a part of it. See, James and John, though physically seen, were spiritually blind. Bartimaeus, though physically blind, was spiritually seen. And it's on those who know their need that Christ pours out his mercy. Would you go to him just recognizing your needs? We're needy people who need to have our eyes open. God, thank you so much for your ability to restore vision physically. Thank you for the way that you heal so many ways. And, but most of all, we thank you for restoring sight spiritually. Yes, once we were lost, but now we're found. Once we were blind, but now we see. Amazing grace, amazing mercy. God, thank you so much for giving us that spiritual vision. But if there's anyone in this room today that has maybe begin, began to lose some of that vision, maybe it has become distorted or pixelized and we no longer see you for who you are. We no longer see how you want to use us in your redemptive work in this world as your disciples. God, open our eyes to see that today. That's what we want you to do for us, to give us vision so that we might see you and how you want us to work for you and with you. In your name we pray, amen. Why don't you go ahead and stand with us this morning?
disciples told Jesus. Best way to come to him is just crying out, and he'll answer and uh, meet you where you are. Now, I know for those of you who are note takers, you have a really high level of anxiety right now because you didn't get all the blanks filled in here. So let me just tell you what they are. The last two, the steps to be a disciple of Jesus are to realize we are blind. And number two, ask Jesus to restore my sight. Maybe you got that, but I just want to make sure that uh, you didn't panic the rest of the day over these notes. Hey, a couple of things I want to remind you of before you leave today. I, we've been talking all month about these. Uh, the Widows, Widowers Banquet that's coming up here. Listen, there's some of us that find ourselves in those categories of life, obviously not by our choice, but we go through that and uh, we provide this ministry for those who are in that stage of, of life that God has singled out. And we provide this place so that you can be encouraged, you can share with others, and we have this dinner coming up, so stop by the hub or the information desk and just sign up for that. We'd love to include you in that. And I got to tell you again about the church picnic coming up on August the 27th. We're bringing a, a Grand Point Church together, Shippensburg, uh, Chambersburg, Greencastle. We're all coming together uh, for a church picnic right after the worship services. August 27th, we're going to meet out at the pavilion. We're going to have people here directing you to find a parking place and uh, get you in here. It's going to be a big day. Uh, but the highlight of this is 1 o'clock, we're going to do some baptisms. Right now, there are 24 individuals that are coming to be baptized, and uh, we're expecting more. Yeah, you can go ahead and applaud that. And I, when I say highlight, it is going to be a highlight because we're going to be able to tell some amazing stories of children and young adults and, uh, and others who have just had their lives changed by Christ. And we're all going to gather around this pool and we're going to celebrate those changed lives. It's going to be amazing. Now, there's going to be some food here as well. Food trucks are going to be lined up and a couple lawn games out there. So all of this starts at 11 o'clock. So if you're free at 11 and want to get your food already, bring a picnic or buy something from the food trucks, uh, feel free to do that. Meet with your small group in the pavilion, gather around with some lawn chairs or uh, whatever. We're going to have some lawn games out there as well and just hang out until one o'clock. And when all the services are, are done, we're going to meet there and uh, do the baptism and celebrate. Uh, the real party is based on the changed lives. And then finally, Reengage Marriage Ministry is the, our marriage ministry that we launched here last year. And uh, it's coming again this fall. We're going to do another round of this. It doesn't matter where you are in your relationship of marriage, good, bad, new, old. Listen, you could benefit or we could benefit from you being there. And so we encourage you to do that as well. And then finally, let me just remind you that here at Grand Point, we believe that giving is a part of our worship. And we encourage you just to give as God enables you to do that. Uh, we have offering receptacles at the back of the church, in the balcony areas, an online giving option when you go to our website. Many ways that you can give, not because we need your money, but God honors you when you become generous and when you become a blessing. The money that you do give, though, goes to serve our community and our world uh, through some global partners, and we just appreciate so much your generosity. Well, let me pray for us as we leave. God, it's so good that we were able to come in here today, and most of us, most of us came in with fairly good physical eyesight. Some of us have prescription glasses or lenses or, you know, whatever to help us with that. But my prayer would be that we would leave today all having a greater spiritual vision, having our vision for Jesus and what he did for us and what he wants, how he wants to partner with us just to change the world around us. God, give us vision. Give us, give us that, that spiritual sight so that we can see the need that is out there in our communities and in our world. And then the vision of how we might be able to meet that. Not by what we do, but by what you do through us. So God, we leave today with having that vision restored and that one request that we make to you. God, just give us more vision. Restore our sight. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.